Namaste. <laughs> so in the last video that we did, freestyle video, we started to talk about consciousness. And just to sum up, in case you don't feel like watching that video again, this consciousness is awareness with an object. And it's like a mirror. It illuminates and reflects whatever is put before it. In other words, whatever our attention is on. Now, the thing about it is, consciousness is a perfect mirror. It reflects whatever is put before it. But what we do is, we put filters in front of consciousness that change what it sees. And so it reflects not only the thing it's looking at, but also the filters. Now, these filters are called in the yoga system vritti. Vritti means a modification of the mind. And, well, what does he mean by mind exactly? Actually, he means consciousness. Because at the end of the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali says, the object of yoga is realizing the chit shakti. What is chit shakti? The power of consciousness. So, in Lakshmi Tantra, she says again and again, actually in all the Sri Vidya scriptures, the goddess claims again and again that she is consciousness, that she normally does not have a form, but that in order to relate to the beings that she's created, sometimes she manifests a form. So, of course, consciousness only has form when it has an object. In other words, when it reflects something, it takes on the form, color, and other qualities of that thing. So consciousness can do this because consciousness is in itself not a thing at all. It's not a relative arising. It's not a dualistic object. Okay? So consciousness can have any kind of object up to and including the whole universe and even God. Consciousness is so powerful, so broad, so great. But then we have to understand what consciousness is doing. Consciousness is simply reflecting. But because we keep putting these filters in front of consciousness, it's not reflecting the actual thing. It's re reflecting the object plus the filters. And what are these filters? They're these vrittis, uh, these conditionings of the mind, these uh, colorations and distortions of pure consciousness. And actually, this is always going to happen when we have an object because the object itself also conditions the consciousness. So vrittis are not only the perceptual filters that, that we create, they are also inherent in the very nature of the objects themselves, because the objects also condition the consciousness. So actually, any form of consciousness, because consciousness is awareness with an object, any form of consciousness is a vritti, a modification of the original awareness, the pure consciousness, in the beginning of the creation. So then, how to realize the pure consciousness? Well, it's actually very simple. And we've been talking about this on this channel for a long time, going way back. That the original and pure object of consciousness is consciousness itself. Now you're going to say, well, how can I, how can consciousness have consciousness as an object if there is nothing different between consciousness and the object? Well, that's the whole point. Consciousness is non-dual. 
So consciousness is not limited by the duality of subject and object. Consciousness can very easily take itself as an object. And in that case, there actually is no object since the object is also the subject. <laughs> it's just so funny how binary logic breaks down <laughs> when we attempt to talk about the absolute. <laughs> but it's something you can try. It's something you can do and experience for yourself <laughs> and get the result, which is very wonderful and blissful, which is to simply remove all of the objects of consciousness until there's nothing left but consciousness itself. And then direct the attention toward that object, which really isn't an object because it's also the subject. Anyway, <laughs> frailties of logic aside, this is a wonderful practice. And actually, I have to say, is the active ingredient in all meditation practices. These different, different practices, you know, so many lineages have so many different practices, are really only a device to get consciousness to examine itself, huh? to concentrate and direct its attention to itself and to contemplate and meditate on its own nature. And so all the scriptures from the Vedas to Vedanta to the Buddhist sutras to the Sri Vidya scriptures, both Vaishnava and Shaivite, are only different collections of these devices to get you to focus consciousness on itself. Because then really wonderful things, inexplicable things, uh, miraculous things start to happen. So let me give a, a, a simple example from Sri Vidya. The Sri Vidya religion is a whole collection of practices to concentrate the mind to various degrees on the Universal Mother. But the Universal Mother herself in the scriptures says many, many times, I am consciousness itself, or I am the egoity. Huh? Egoity is a wonderful word. It means the selfness of the self. To, to say that I am the egoity of God or Brahman is to say I am the selfness of the self. <laughs> well, the self is nothing but selfness. <laughs> Just like Brahman is nothing but pure consciousness without an object other than itself. So the, the mother, the, the universal mother, from which everything arises, including our everyday consciousness with objects and the objects themselves. I mean, it's really, I'm smiling and laughing because it's really kind of a cosmic joke, you know. If your mindset, if your background ontology, if your model or understanding of the universe is based on duality, then you're always going to insist that consciousness must have an object. So the trick is how to, how to trick you into taking your own consciousness as the object. Well, then let's create this metaphor that the, because the consciousness actually is the source of everything that we perceive, huh? then by directing the consciousness toward the goddess and make that a habit and then say the goddess is actually consciousness, she kind of just short circuits the whole thing and leads to this wonderful realization which I experienced for the first time 
in 1984 where you see the world as consciousness and consciousness as the world. I mean, it, it's really inexplicable. Huh? It's, it's so non-dual. It doesn't fit into any of our perceptual categories. What to speak of analytical categories. Yet, it's a definite experience that anybody can have. Anyone is qualified because everyone, every being that exists is also consciousness. <laughs> so if you can become conscious of this video, you can also realize the Brahman simply by focusing the consciousness on consciousness. Now you might say, well, now you tell this, huh? Well, actually, I told it seven or eight years ago, but nobody could understand it. So, during the time between then and now, I have been developing various metaphors. Huh? Like, I love that line in that Star Trek movie where <laughs> Spock is saying, the hell I will, the hell I am. <laughs> And the captain says to him, Spock, what are you doing? He says, practicing colorful metaphors. <laughs> so the most colorful metaphors imaginable are those which clothe the inconceivable and inexplicable Brahman, the non-dual perfect consciousness in various forms, imaginary, metaphorical forms, and then finally at the end reveals that, oh, actually those were just metaphors. I wasn't really talking about hell. <laughs> the hell I was. <laughs> I was really talking about consciousness. So I can say I wasn't really talking about the goddess. I wasn't really talking about the Buddha. Huh? I wasn't really talking about any of this stuff that we've been talking about on this channel. But it was all a metaphor. It was all a device to get you to, for even a fraction of a second, contemplate your own consciousness. Though this is the purpose of all religion. Now, this is different from what Neo Advaita says, Neo Advaita says, paraphrasing Ramana Maharshi incorrectly, that, well, you're already Brahman, so all you have to do is claim it, and then that's it. There's no more sadhana to do. No, that's not right. It's true that, yes, you are already Brahman, but to realize that is a specific experience which is only attainable by sadhana. And what is sadhana? Developing one or more of these metaphors until it leads to a clear consciousness of consciousness, where consciousness becomes its own object, and then the qualities of consciousness are revealed, uh, and you can directly experience them. See, Whereas Neo-Advaita is simply a claim it's simply a verbal statement, I am Brahman. So the difference is between a verbal claim and an actual experience of the real thing. And so what we've been offering all along and advocating for and encouraging people for is to have this experience, to confront your own consciousness. <laughs> as if looking in a mirror, right? That was the first metaphor we used back in the good old uh, Golden Flower series. That you think of yourself as looking at yourself in a mirror, but instead of you looking at the self in the mirror, the self in the mirror is looking at you, which makes your consciousness its own object. So this is a wonderful metaphor. And so 
are so many others, you know. And, and this is the thing that commercial teachers will never tell you because it immediately blows up their whole trip. That actually, <laughs> whatever I'm talking about is just a metaphor. It's not exactly a lie. It's not a lie because it's trying to put you into a certain state in which the truth is self-evident. Therefore, it's not a lie, it's a device. And it has a specific application and it has a specific result, which we call enlightenment or self-realization. And if you're a, a dishonest person, you can claim to have self-realization and nobody can disprove it. But if you're an honest person, you will practice one of these metaphors until you have that experience and prove it to yourself because you really can't prove it to anybody else. <laughs> and that's okay. That's just the way it is. Om Tatsat. Om Shakti Om.